thought we would do today is just go over the facts of this particular case, then go over th um, <coughs> specifically questions, of any questions on any of the documents in the packet, because uh, I really would like you to have read all of the cases and the statute in order to engage on more significantly for the purposes of the simulation. And I think we'll have plenty of time Tuesday and Thursday of next week to wrap it all up. Um, so by Tuesday, have read through um, this, uh, all of the cases, and then uh, chapter 233. How many had to do that for today? I, for today, according to the syllabus, you only had to read part of the, ca the, the cases that went through um, adoption of Daisy. Oh, okay. That I also have signed for next Tuesday, more of the child sexual abuse cases, as well as the hearsay statute. Um, yes, all the way through Master of the Laws, Chapter 233, 81, 82, 83. Okay. So if you look at the syllabus, by Tuesday, we should be on track. You will have read everything, and then we can engage in the, in the, in the, mock, in the, in the simulation. So more it's just understanding the facts and yes. the details. Yes, yeah, yeah. So let's, what I've done um, is I put on the board the three different cases that um, Lee, and his, Lee and or Lee and his family were ultimately um, engaged in. So why don't we start with um, the chronology I don't know if I want to start with the uh, Commonwealth, the, the, his criminal case or the Cameron Protection case. Let's start with um, the scene where um, the social worker, Ellen, we, we're calling her Ellen, and she's Ellen in the packet. And you might want to just jot down these names for yourself, too. So social worker is Ellen, and the policewoman, whose name is Kathy. Okay. Kathy. So let's start with the scene where Ellen and Kathy uh, arrive at Lee's home. Lee is not there at the time. Okay. Can somebody tell me why Lee is not there and why they arrive at the home, Richard? He's been arrested. Yes. Um, well, he's been arrested, and where is he at the time? Was he in jail? No, he wasn't in jail. He was in court. He was in court right here being arraigned. So I call it the Commonwealth versus Lee case. Um, and, he's be, and he was being arraigned, let's say, I think the date was somewhere around April 21st. I could be wrong. I'm just going from memory here. Um, and he's, he's at his arraignment. When, again, when Ellen and Kathy go to Lee's home. Now, someone tell me why and how did this happen that uh, social worker Ellen, policewoman Kathy, are at Lee's home where, um, where Alicia, Jason, and Jonathan are. Oh, they wanted to explain to the children why they Wait, were no. Why are they there? Nadege? Because there was a complaint of... Um, Not a complaint, anger. but you got it. There was a what? Phone call. A phone call. But what was the phone call? <laughs> From what that, we um, reviewed last time. A 51A report. A 50, 51A report. A report because at the time he's okay, been arrested, um, not indicted. He actually was in district court that day. He ultimately did get indicted and the case was kicked over to Superior Court. Um, but he's in district court on his arraignment. So, um, who's the 51A mandated reporter that alerts DCF at the time it was DSS um, about the kids? John? Is it Justin's mother? Uh, no, she's not the mandated reporter. Oh. Just as my, uh, uh, that's another scenario of how this case, how the criminal case against Lee, you know, started off. Okay, hold, hold on to that for a second. 
Um, but how is it? Who's, who's the 51A reporter? That's cool. Lester? The police. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The police are investigating Lee allegedly sexually assaulting slash raping Justin. All right. At the same time, uh, there's the 51A mandated report, right? Reasonable cause to believe children are being abused or neglected, in particular Lee's children, because um, the police district attorney's office find, find, uh, find out through the course of the investigation, it's not just Justin, the neighbor boy, but Lee's own children involved as well. Um, so, gets screened in, and both Ellen, the social worker, and Kathy go very quickly, you know, again, emergency situation to investigate and they speak. What's that? To investigate possibility of sexual abuse of, the, of his own children. Yes, yes. So now they're at the house, and what transpires at the house? Janita? Um, they have conversations with the, with, um, the children. Okay, separately. so let's be specific about that they have conversations. Ellen and um, Kathy. Well, Ellen speaks to the children separately to ask them about what their father has been doing. Have they witnessed it? Has their father abused them? Wait, stop. Too fast. Okay. They both arrive at the, ho at the house. Mm -hmm. Who's there? The two older kids. Where's Jonathan? He's, a, he's there too. He's there too. Yeah. The babysitting Jonathan and their dad is in court. Okay. Um, so it's Ellen and Kathy. Three kids, little Jonathan running around, right? Who talks to who? They both started to talk to her. They both started to talk. Right. And, and then? And then was Alicia the starts Ellen. telling her. Actually, they, they first talked to Jason. And Jason says that he's never um, been involved in any, any inappropriate behavior with his father. That they, the, the extent of their relationship was, you know, he would wrestle with them, you know, but, but nothing of sexual nature. So hold on a second, because there got to be some, there has to be some introductory language. You know, knock on the door. They're looking for, you know, the lead children, right? What conversations come about at least initially? Why they're here? Mm -hmm. the, the initial conversation was that they wanted to explain to them why their father was arrested, and they asked them had they witnessed their father doing this. No, again, you're jumping too fast. You're arriving at the door where so and so. Do you know why we're here? Doesn't Alicia say something? Do you know why we're here? Yeah, look at your packets. <laughs> and then she responded that she knew why, because he was a child abuser. Yes. A child molester. Yes. Yes, I know why you're here. My dad's a child molester. So that was the nature of sort of the, you know, just try to picture this scene. They're not just immediately jumping in, oh, we, we, you know, we want to question you specifically about A to Z. There has to be some initial conversation. So uh, Alicia, and that's one of the, one of the, I shouldn't say many, maybe one of the few quotes in the materials that you have. Yes, because my dad's a child molester. Okay. Now, in terms of who interviews um, the children separately, um, remember, it, Ash just mentioned it was Jason. The reason why it was Jason is because where's Jonathan and what's Alicia doing? She's holding and He's trying to run out the door. She runs outside with him. Um, Jason in, initially is, is there. Um, but then she comes back in, correct? Yep. All right. So there's not much going on at first with, with, with Jason. Um, there's some initial conversation. But um, that's not when they learn you know, the, the substance of what he says. That's not till later. Um, so effectively, it's really Alicia that speaks first, because then Jason um, um, leaves with Jonathan, and Alicia is speaking and using the anatomically correct dots, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so what does Alicia say? 
Which Alicia basically tells the worker that her dad suggests or forces her brother to have sex with her. Okay, and she so describes the different sex acts that the brother is performing on her. So, the father all right, so Alicia, Alicia and Jason, what else did they learn from Alicia initially? That while this is going on, the father's also in bed with them. Okay. And they ask a question along the lines of, uh, do you think or has he done it to other people? And she basically says, well, Jason's friends come over to the house. I usually stay at my girlfriend's, but I wouldn't doubt him. Right, them. so she's, she, she has no information about Justin. Again, the, those acts precipitated the criminal, the initial criminal prosecution. Um, anything else about what Alicia says, uh, Lester? I would just change what you said slightly. It's oh. not that she has no information. She does have information. She doesn't say she has information because... She says, she, I wasn't there. When Justin comes over, I sleep at my friend's house. Yes, except mm -hmm. for the fact that we find out later that she has been there with Justin. They've been in the bedroom together. No. No, not Alicia. Well? No. Yeah. That's Alicia and her brother, Jason. No, but she, no, said, she said that, um, yeah. actually Jason said that once the father told him to get in, both of them, Justin yeah. and Jason, but Justin didn't want to, he just watched. That's right. Right, right. Right, yeah. so. Not Alicia. She does have information concerning Justin, but she doesn't say she does. She doesn't say she does. She says, I'm, I wasn't there. Um, right. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Um, Thank you, <laughs> What about the anatomically correct dolls? What does the social worker and, and police woman find out from Alicia's portrayal and use of the dolls? Yes. That uh, in the in depicting the scene, Jason had no clothes on the, mm. the doll. Mm -hmm. Jason had no clothes on those, um, and they had, he used it to, to illustrate that he was on top of her in a sexually duplicit way. Okay. Okay. Richard? When when the worker asked uh, Alicia to describe the ex, she got more and more upset. She couldn't exactly yes. describe herself. Mm -hmm. So they then moved the dolls into certain positions. Mm -hmm. And she would reply yes, as in, yes, that's what happened. Uh, I'm glad you said that because of lo a lot of the re the uh, question and answers that you're seeing, both in the social worker's notes as well as the um, Kathy's notes as well, um, are typically, um, and we'll talk about questioning techniques later on as well, are, uh, many of them are the leading questions answered by a yes or a no. Um, okay. Um, what else do we know about the family situation? Do we learn anything else about, and, and again, this is just at this first um, um, interview of the children. What else do we know about the family? Yeah. Just that uh, Alicia went back to live with the offender in this case after her mother died in a car accident. Yeah, what do you mean by went back? Because that was unclear for a long time and it was just picked up on um, in, in the notes. I mean, you only have, I don't know, a tenth or less <laughs> of this case. It seemed, um, that, <laughs> it seemed, that, the, it seemed that the stepfather and the mother. Stepfather. Okay, so Lee, this is what, okay. So in terms of the family, Lee is, who's bio father? Jonathan. Just Jonathan. Just Jonathan's. And then he's also stepdad of Alicia. And Jason. And he adopted. And Jason. But he adopted Jason. Jason. Not so, Alicia. Yeah. Okay. He was in the prime. And where's mom? Where's their mom? She's dead. How? Carson. Carson. Where? North Carolina. Carolina. <laughs> you guys know the case better than I do. I try to go from memory rather than read it all over again. You try to forget this stuff after you've read it, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm dying. Uh, 
So, and they moved up uh, to Massachusetts at, at some point. But what Richard just said, and, and we only have um, very little facts to go on, but it looks like for a period of time, and somebody else says it as well, that they were separated for a period of time, and it looks like at least Alicia was with mom for some reason, but then they were reunited, reunited and then mom uh, died after that. Uh, let's see, we're still on that first day. Is there anything else? Okay, so um, then Jason's interview um, pretty much is held by um, the social worker, okay? And anybody want to relate that? I'm sorry, what's the question? Uh, J uh, Jason's interview, uh, Ellen's interview of Jason. Let's talk about that. And Ed? Um, Jason was more... Hold on, when he first came back in, and Alicia was there, um, she told him to um, tell the truth. Telling him, to t you know, yes, talk to them, tell the truth. He he's teary-eyed, he's crying. Um, everybody leaves except Ellen, so Ellen stays alone with him, right? Okay. Um, and what does he tell Ellen? Um, that, um, that he what his father did with him? Yes. And when does he say it started? And they both um, they both related that there was an incident at least a month before um, that day. When does Jason say it started? Yeah. So back in Carolina. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Um, what does Jason say now? This is where the social worker and the um, and Kathy, the policewoman, also find out more about Justin, because remember, Alicia said, ah, no, I wasn't there, I wasn't there. Um, so what does Jason say about Justin and his dad's involvement with him? That when um, Justin would come to the house, the father would bring him and Jason into a room and abuse him as well. That, of course, the allegations were true. He didn't say the allegations were true, but of course what he said led them to believe that the allegations were true. He also spoke about the father, um, having Jason get into the bed with Alicia and telling Justin to do the same, but Justin refused. Okay. Um, now this is important as well in terms of what the dad gets charged with. Um, so the acts that Jason and Alicia described um, between them and their dad, um, those of you that know criminal law at all, um, how would you depict those acts? in terms of what he should be charged with. What's that? The, the criminal charge? Yes. Uh, it, would be, it would be incest, and it's, uh, it would be rape in this case. Rape okay. The child, and rape the child under, under 14. Under 14. Yeah. And or, and there's lesser included offenses assault, of that. Indecent, indecent assault rape. and battery. Um, now notice that the, the only um, act again, the alleged, that involved penetration was allegedly Jason and Alicia, right? Not Dad and Alicia, not Dad and Justin. Dad, Dad and Jason. Dad and Jason. Dad and Jason as well. Yes, and Jeff. Okay. Uh, penetration, no. It was just Jason and Alicia. No. 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 Jason, Jason also said that. All right. <laughs> Believe me. Yeah. Jason also said that his father... Yeah. Yeah. Entered him. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's right, that's right. When you married him upstairs. Yeah. 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 yeah, see, I'm remembering. I'm remembering. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 just, I had a question when I was reading this last night on the timeline. Right, and that's what we're trying to go through right now. Did Lee mm -hmm. molest or have inter sexual interaction with? Jason prior to the mother's death? No. We don't know. Because if it was know. back in Carolina yeah. Yeah. a month yeah. before they yeah. moved to Massachusetts, yeah. Yeah. I was confused there. Yeah. This had started yeah. before the mother's death. I know Alicia said it was after the mother's Alicia death. Alicia said it was after. But yeah. but Jason mm -hmm. had had Lee already started with Jason prior to 
mother's death? Well, the that, mother's accident. I mean, the answer is yes. At the time, we didn't know. Okay. So keep that so in mind. So this is really as not I, about the mother's death. As I, well, I, I, I'll tell you more about the case after we do our simulation. So I'll tell you how the case evolved after that's, that's that. Because there was, in fact, this, this um, at least try at getting a deal together. Uh -huh. 50, 36, okay. and 37. Now. What's that? 50, 36, and 37. Now. Yeah. 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 So, 51A, right? And this was the 51B, app, the, you know, the, at least the beginning of the 51B investigation is Ellen at the home. Obviously, the kids leave with them and go where? It's Child and Family Services. DSS, was it? Yeah, first they go to the office. And then they go to the uncle's house. Okay, they don't go to the uncle's house right away. Um, so they're at the office. And when they are at the office, who does Helen hear from? The brother. Well, even the before uncle. that, even before that, I believe before that. So when they were at the house? Um, no, at the office. Well, they, I think they take them quickly to the office because they find out that Lee is out on on on, on bail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he leaves court, goes home, finds out about the kids, and doesn't he call? He calls. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so there's a conversation. So this is important to remember too, because we're going to be talking about a lot of the hearsay stuff later on. So now we're going to have a conversation, uh, the phone conversation of Lee with Ellen, right? What does Lee tell Ellen? Where are my kids? I want to see uh, my kids. Yeah. What else does he say, John? Ultimately, at the at the interview. Kind of like well, Lee's not really interviewed. No, I was it, just it, saying, what does he... Oh, oh I'm sorry, go I ahead. I don't remember him saying a lot until he went and did his interview, I think, with Ellen. When, where he, well, said, he, when he, he had a conversation with Ellen. Yeah. Yeah, okay. He, the, um, he said he admitted to sexual abuse. When you he say... He didn't admit, specify. <laughs> what, what was the conversation? That, that was interpreted as an admission. What was the conversation he had with Ellen? That he told them that to punish them, he would have them undress. Well, that kind of is a little bit later. What does he say at first? And I can't remember if it was the first initial phone call with Ellen or, or a later conversation with Ellen. So as Ash said before, if, okay, my kids, yeah, um, we, and Ellen is saying, but probably, you know, your brother's going to pick them up. They, um, Alicia might stay with your mom, blah, blah, blah. And then Lee says something to Ellen. Well, she says you probably want to get an attorney. Yeah. Involving your sexual abuse with your children. Yeah. What does he say? Because at that point, they're talking about it that happened. But it, again, is loosely interpreted later on by him as the supposed shower incident. But he says to Ellen initially, what? He makes some conversation about his past. Do you remember? Yeah, I'm trying to get counseling. He was, he was sexually abused. Look, Nadege, he was what? He was sexually abused. He, he said, oh, yeah, when I was little, I was at a skating rink, and somebody, you know, some guy did something to me, and, um, you know, I, and I think about these things, and I... Uh, that, was it, a, that was a phone call? Or, yeah, that was, that was a I don't know if that was a phone call again or a conversation with Ellen later on. Yeah. Um, she first speaks to the brother on by phone. Oh, yes, before, yes. Before she speaks to Lee. Okay, all right. Because she's going to place them, you know, where we, you know, and they say, you know, our Uncle Tony's around, et cetera. But her conversation with Lee is very, again, nebulous. nebulous. Lee doesn't give the amount of um, uh, specifics 
that his that Ellen and Kathy learned from the first interview with the children. He just talks about it happening and couldn't believe that you know it was going on in his home. That he thought of others as uh, sexual predators, but not of himself, and that he needed help. He so but he doesn't relate anything specifically to Ellen. He right? says that he was confused. That he yes. Remember how many times? Yeah. He yeah. And then he <clears throat> thought he was going to was going to go meet with his parents to talk about it one he time, but called it off. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Besides going to now Uncle Tony, and I know that Alicia um, was part of the time with the grandmother as well, but ultimately they're all with Uncle Tony for a while. Um, where else do the children go that's really important initially? So they have the first conversation again uh, as part of the 51B investigation with Ellen counseling. and Kathy. What's that? Is it counseling at the. Well, it's not counseling, it's an actual another Physical. interview that's called the SANE interview. And that's in 51D, I think, of your statute that it's explained. So they take the children. It's like a multidisciplinary team, um, usually behind like glass doors, windows, so you know, uh, professionals can watch and so forth. And um, so these professionals are thinking that you know Alicia and John are now going to give more specifics, so they can get going on what should be you know you know and start. Um, deciding what to do in terms of the family and, and possible criminal prosecution and all of that. So what transpires at this same interview of the children? They don't want to be back with their father. No, no, not at the interview with the, the in terms of the, uh, yes, t you're right, but what, if anything, do the children say at this interview? They're comfortable with answering more questions, but they felt they had answered them all already. Yeah, the, there's no, they give no specifics at all. They answer again, some questions yes, yeah, some questions no, they're both crying. Alicia is not, doesn't even want to look, she's hiding in her sleeve. Um, so the interview quickly, you know, um, finish, ends because there's, you know, they realize they can't do anything with these kids. The kids are just traumatized and not going to say anything. Um, so again, remember that because I, we're going to be talking about these out-of-court statements to Ellen and to Kathy. So, by the way, um, we talked about the C&P process. 51D also mentions that when it's an a, a, a act of a sexual nature, besides Department of uh, Children's and Children and Families, the district attorney's office now gets notified. So the district attorney's office gets the 51A, the 51B, and then later on, you know, when the service plans start coming out. And they did, as I said, this case lasted much longer than six months. So district attorney gets everything. Um, everything meaning everything that's the part of the civil care and protection case that's supposed to be involved with, you know, helping families get together. So, where are we? Um, so, Ellen, the, the, that next morning, because the children were taken, re removed from the parents' home, Ellen goes in, right, and files the care and protection petition, the 11924, emergency hearing with her affidavit, DCF gets temporary custody. Right. Remember, the judge, reasonable cause to believe these children are um, used neglected. Now, remember that Alicia and Jason, are, are, um, all three are the subject of the petition. Uh, there are no specific acts that have been described regarding Jason. I mean, I'm Jonathan. sorry, Jonathan, okay? But all three, so it's care and protection of Alicia, Jason, and Jonathan as well. All right. So the case starts off that way, the case meaning the care and protection case. Again, meanwhile, there's a criminal case open and potential at this point, um, and does happen later on, uh, another criminal complaint and ultimate indictment um, against Lee for the sexual molestation slash rape of Alicia and, and Jason. So here we are with the, with the um, Care and protection case. On that day, attorneys get appointed. Attorney for Lee, 
initially an attorney for Lee and an attorney for the children, okay? Um, and a court appointed investigator, and you have that report in your package. I'll get back to the investigator in a moment. But initially, the um, attorney for Lee, um, I'm sorry, for the children, was asked to bring the children to another interview at the uh, um, district attorney's office. Okay. He showed up with actually Uncle Tony and the children. And so that interview started, you know, again, like the same interview with the children not saying anything. Because remember now, by this time, they had retracted their initial statements. Said, we never said that, the words were put in our mouth. We said yes and no, and both, et cetera. But we were saying yes and no to the shower incident, right? And not to the specifics that Ellen and Kathy claimed that we said initially. So here they are, Uncle Tony brings them, they meet the lawyer, they meet the district attorney. The interview starts and it abruptly ends because Tony flies off the handle and he says, um, no, these kids are not gonna say anything. Um, fires the children's attorney. Okay. Hires, again this is Uncle Tony, hires another attorney for the children. Um, DCF goes into court right away with some kind of motion, I forget what it was, um, you know, arguing that there's all kinds of conflict because Uncle Tony is, um, you know, procured counsel. Uh, the court then appoints a guardian a light up because the court says, no, okay, we can keep the new, the new attorney for the children is fine. He is acting in accordance with their expressed wishes. They're older, they're mature, they go to school, they're saying they want to be with dad. But we will, uh, the court will appoint a guardian ad litem that will also be there for the children's best, best, best interests. So again, we, we have the GAL, we have the new attorney, not court appointed, but hired by the uncle. We have Lee's attorney, um, we have the DCF attorney, um, and the district attorney. And the guardian ad litem. And the guardian ad litem. Okay, so where are we at? Um, so in the meantime, the court appointed investigator goes and talks to Alicia and Jason, to Lee. Uh, I think she talked to Uncle Tony. You guys will tell me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, reviews their you know school records, talks to their teachers, etc. Um, writes a report, actually two reports. You have an updated one, what's a report of the facts and recommendation. visitation so even though this is a very serious case he still gets gets visitation but it's supervised visitation at DCF offices so he's, he's getting visitation kids are with um, Uncle Tony um, just trying to remember the chronology here between the between the, when the case started and when it was ready for trial. At some point, and that's why I'm trying to remember, Justin and his family actually moved out of state. Oh yeah, now I remember. Um, the CMP case is sort of going to pre-trial in the court and he was trying to determine, you know, who will the witnesses be that DCF has? And there's a, there's a provision in 119 that typically you have, you know, we talked about it, the DCF attorney is the, you know, they're the petitioner, they move forward, it's their burden of proof. Um, but on motion, they can actually have um, the assistant district attorney 
also involved in the case and actually um, acting as counsel for the state. And the reason why they wanted to do that is because they wanted to put Justin on as a witness. Uh, when you think about the evidence the, the, that, that, that DCF had for the Karen protection case, by the way, it's somewhere in there you have um, just a piece of a medical report, okay? So the medical report revealed nothing, nothing, okay? So no evidence of rape of either child. It was no physical, no physical evidence. Um, so there's no physical evidence. Uh, again, the out-of-court statements, and we're going to talk about those a lot, of Jason and Alicia to Ellen and to Kathy. But then they had a live witness, and the live witness for both, you know, his own criminal trial as well as the Karen Protection trial would have been Justin. I say would have been, because after all the fights about, you know, whether Justin's going to testify in the Karen Protection case, and the district attorney wanted to be the one to do the direct examination because he'd be traumatized, lo and behold, you can't make this stuff up. You really can't make this stuff up. It's like <laughs> uh, even more crazy and surreal than made up stuff. The whole family disappeared. They moved out of state. Justin's family. Justin's family. So that meant that the, that criminal case was gone. It was gone. And that meant that you know the key witness that DCF would have had in the Karen protection case was also gone. But DA still decides um, to indict Lee in Superior Court uh, for the sexual assault and rape of his two children. So then, um, so these two cases are on a track going forward for trial. Lee's criminal case and the care protection case of his children. Now I mentioned the court appointed investigators report while acknowledging that she believed there was, in fact, um, sexual abuse of the children. She also recommended reunification, if you've read that. Who's going to be playing that? Is it Cassandra? Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, what's that? I thought that was very interesting. Yes. So there were a lot of positives. Um, now, remember that Lee, um, you know, when we talked about perpetrators the other day in relation to domestic abuse, and we talked about the, uh, you know, the behavioral sort of characteristics of the batterer, that um, they typically appear more put together. Lee was the personification of Whatever. that. He would wear, you know, the argyle sweaters and the loafers. Um, had his little, you know, briefcase and very uh, clean cut, put together. Now remember, he was also a um, um, bomb disposal. Uh, uh, bomb disposal. Uh, service man who then suffered from diabetes and was. Um, actually had just been, uh, he was on leave for a while and then he had left the service. Um, so he had, a, you know, a fairly good job. Um, why did I bring this up? This Because he fit the profile of the <laughs> batterer who looks good and exactly. seems, seems So um, the said. children did, and you've got that in the uh, recommendations of the um, court point investigator, did very well in school. And and so and you didn't have a, a, a situation where their grades dropped, no. you know. Um, in fact, from even from the mother's death on, um, other than um, that, Lee's expert was this doctor that's uh, alluded to in your packet as well. Um, that uh, Lee goes to and at some point takes the kids to, and I'm trying to remember when, but. Um, you know, that doctor acknowledges that there was some sort of trauma, but he doesn't quite know if the trauma was related to the mother's death and the kids sort of, you know, just moving on from that. Again, the kids still uh, doing marvelous in school. The teachers couldn't say enough um, good about them. Everyone talks about how great a father Lee was to all three children, um, and again, this is the social, I'm not the social worker, the investigator's recommendation. And she says, you know, you know, it shouldn't happen right away. She does recommend that he go to perpetrators, you know, whatever it's called, I can't remember, and that the children engage in counseling as well. 
Um, so she's talking about it, you know, even though she mentions reunification, it's still a, 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 long, a long road. Um, but here's part of the dilemma. You have the care, if you are Representative Lee, and that's Lester and John, you have your client involved in a care and protection case where the potential is losing custody, you know, and maybe parental rights, and that's serious enough. But at least in that case, you've got the department, you know, a civil agency who is willing to work with you um, and your client to achieve reunification. But in doing so, your client's going to be admitting <laughs> to acts that's going to, you know, put him in a lot more jeopardy. Personal, I mean, still he, you know, has a lot to lose in the care protection case, but going to put him into a lot more jeopardy in terms of his liberty. Yeah. Um, and remember the uh, right, the interplay between the district attorney getting the information. And this is one of the examples where we talk about care and protection, we say, well, it's a civil case, but you can still be subjected to criminal charges, to criminal charges, to opening yourself up. So it, it, district attorney's goal is prosecution. Department's goal is strengthen and encourage family life. So this is very, very tricky. Uh, and it gets trickier, again, when you have this case where um, the only evidence now that the department has is out-of-state, out-of-court statements. We learned from Daisy that's not the case. What's that? We learned from the, the Daisy case that... Okay, and that's why you're going to get into um, the case law, case case law on the criminal side, um, case law on the criminal side where the perpetrator is not a family member as well as on the criminal side where the perpetrator is, and again case law on the care protection adoption side where the perpetrator is um, a family member and where the burdens you know, are so different too in both. We are, you're also going to be looking at the statute chapter 233, 81, 82, 83. I want you to all assume that Jason is just under 10 so we can discuss whether and to what extent his statements can come in pursuant to the statute, okay? So you're gonna be looking at um, 81 is the criminal, 233, 81. So if the district attorney wants to get in his statement, Jason's statements, uh, out of court statements in the criminal case, he's got a, or she, no, he, who's the DA, I forgot. Um, Joe, I think it's you, and you and may Jeremiah. not know it because you weren't here. I think it's Joe and uh, Jeremiah. It's you, Joe, and Jeremiah will be your co-counsel. So you'll be talking about um, how you can satisfy 23381 to get Jason's statements in, okay? And then also, you know, um, on, in the care protection case, Jason's statements pursuant to 233.83, and who's DCF? Jadita and Richard. Yes. Okay. Um, so you'll be talking about, you know, and then with regard to Alicia's statements, you want to look at some of the, these common law cases, the case law, and whether and to what extent any of her statements fall under any exceptions to the hearsay rule, or if they're going to come in, how the judge should consider them. Um, so a lot of what we'll discuss has to deal with these adequate statements, um, as well as the, uh, um, uh, to what extent um, does the investigative stuff come in. Okay. Now the investigator has a report that's all hearsay, and it's even hearsay upon the totem pole hearsay as well, because she speaks to um, Alicia and Jason, but then she also speak. Oh, you know what I didn't have up here? She also spoke to Ellen and Kathy. And so, in a report, says Ellen said that Jason said, right? Um, and then she makes recommendations as well. So, you, you know, the judge also considers the report of the investigator as well as the investigator um, is also subject to cross-examination by the parties as, as well. Um, guardian ad litem is not so much investigative here. 
the judges, um, the judge appointed that person again because there was such a to do about that new attorney that took over the, for the kids. That um, and at that time, um, CPS, CPCS did not exist either. So even though you know the 80s, it was in the 80s, and so it was still a good 10 to 15 years after you know attorneys were acting for children, um, they did tend to act for children more of a best interest nature. So it was almost unheard of that you had an attorney go, coming in in a child sexual abuse case saying, um, no, they didn't say that. Uh, no, they, they want to stay, they, they need to be back home with their dad. Because usually attorneys back then, all children's attorneys, tend to, to, to side with the state um, relative to care and protection, child abuse and neglect cases. So you have that issue as well. So the attorney mm -hmm. that was, um, the new attorney that came in for the kids, yeah. that's what they so would do? So he actively were... opposed DCF. Okay. Yes. So their position was, and it will be a, a simulation as well, whoever has um, Jason and Alicia here, um, that uh, uh, you would be attacking not only the, the, um, the substance and the form of the questioning that was done by Ellen and Kathy. There are very few statements, you know, because he's a child molester is probably a statement that's going to come in, and I want you to think about why should that come in. But a lot of the substance of um, what allegedly happened is not coming directly from any statement of Alicia and Jason's. It's coming more from the type of questioning that the social worker and the policewoman did. Um, so that's an issue as well, Ash. So Jason and Alicia's attorneys are going to be advocating um, for the uh, for return home. The home. Return. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let you ponder things for a moment, Lester. <laughs> oh wait, Lester, can you tell the class I had one t one typo where it should have been the uncle and not Lee? What page was that? Page eleven at the bottom. Page eleven at the bottom, where it says Mr. Lee called back. Right. Um, at that point, that's the uncle because it said worker explained CMP hearing the next day. Also, worker encouraged him to tell his brother to speak with an attorney since he may be charged with his own children and worker must refer to the DA's office. So that conversation is Ellen with the uncle, okay? So just the uncle called back. Yes, yeah, so uncle called back. stuff out about Lee's children, um, which then precipitated uh, Lee being investigated and ultimately indicted um, criminally uh, against his children. Yes? My question was, I remember when we were going over um, 51B investigation and comparing it to the court-appointed investigator. Isn't the point of the court-appointed investigation for the, um, the court to see whether the allegations in 51B are true? No, no, no. It's so it doesn't a, cause a conflict for any right. question? Right, yeah, it's, it's not to follow up <laughs> and to, you know, to determine if the initial 51B, in fact, when the case goes to trial, when, when the 72 hour hearing first starts, for example, the 51As and the 51Bs, in terms of evidence, they're not offered to prove the truth. They just come in to quote what we call set the stage. Okay. Um, 
and and uh, it, it, there has to be direct evidence of abuse or neglect. So when I mentioned before that the only really hard evidence they had was Justin, <coughs> and Justin was gone. Um, so just they, to clarify, they, that was no yeah. conflict then. So, so when and if the case goes to trial, and this is what you want to discuss in your roles, DCF's case is going to be Ellen on the stand, relating conversations. So you want to, you know, be able to argue either way whether those conversations should come in or not. Same thing. The policewoman Kathy as well on the stand relating conversations. The um, investigator and the GAL because that's all you have as DCF. Um, now again, your burden is lower in the camp protection case, clear and convincing evidence of Lee's unfitness, um, whereas in the criminal case, those of you that are the DAs here, it's obviously <laughs> a higher burden, proof beyond a reasonable doubt that he had sexually assaulted slash raped his children. And that's why the parties did get together to see if the, any resolution you know, could come out you know, pending both of those cases you know, going to trial. So both children were not his biological children. Jason was adopted by Lee. Who adopted Alicia? Was it, was it the, the, the wife? I'll tell you guys later. No, she's not adopted. They're actually from a previous husband. She's a stepchild. She was a stepchild, but they said that the, um, the proceed, the paperwork didn't come through yet for her, but he was in the process. Yeah, of that's what Lee her. said. That's yeah. Right. Okay, that's what Lee said. Well, I was wondering when I was reading this last night from the uh, termination of rights point of view. Yes. Is this if Lee were to go on trial? in a criminal proceeding and be found guilty, would that automatically terminate his parental no. rights? No, no, so there Evident was, yeah, it's evidence of unfitness, certainly, but it's not automatic. So there would be a separate yes. civil it, DCF would still have to go forward, proceeding. yeah. It would be easier, of course, but DCF would still have to go forward. John? How closely does the um, guardian ad litem work with the children? Um, actually, um, the guardian ad litem got to know the children rather well um, and did take them at one point to, um, oh, the guy has died, but he was an eminent expert in uh, sexual abuse. Um, was it the Smith Baker Center? But um, the sad thing, again, about the, because they, re, they recanted from day one, um, they didn't even open up to this particular expert either. But the guardian ad litem, you know, would transport them to, you know, psych appointments like that um, and, you know, was available for all the trial proceedings. But again, didn't, didn't write any investigation or report, was, wasn't appointed for that particular purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so who represents, who's the GAL in here? Okay, Patricia. Yeah, so you would be, obviously, you, you have what your position is because I've given it to you. Um, so again, the children haven't opened up specifically to you, but um, at one point did, did tell you, um, even if they were abused, they that they, them. yeah. But it's your position still. To see what's best for them. Yes. Yep. Yep. It's surprising how like accommodating they are with, with Lee. Just based on the circumstances, they're just. Remember, I said that uh, 11926 in the first paragraph um, mandates that children have to come to court at least once. That that they have to be acknowledged by the court because they're the subject of the proceeding. But then they're dismissed. Jason and Alicia um, came to every single hearing um, with dad 
in the middle. Uh, you know, he would show up separately because he didn't have custody um, and sat with their father for all of the camp protection um, hearings. And the court allowed that? Yeah. The court, yeah. the court have prevented it? it, it no, they couldn't, yeah, yeah, it could, no. I mean, uh, I don't remember, I, I, the department never uh, opposed or asked for, you know, you can do sequestration of witnesses and right. so forth, but that wasn't an issue that they, they were allowed to Because say. they weren't afraid of them. Uh, Is that why? Uh, uh, yeah, allegedly. Right. Really yeah. John. It seems, looking at this and not having all the information, it seems like it was kind of a misstep to let, I guess, Jason went and stayed with the uncle, but it seemed like the uncle, it seemed like the other person was Lee's mother, I think, that maybe Alicia stayed with. Yeah, at least mother, but it, Alicia didn't stay with her very long. They yeah, were, they were all together with like she, she was She was very interested. In, she said at one point she didn't want to hear it, hear it, it sounded, the grandmother, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. But it seems like mm -hmm. it would. It seems like why would you place them with the uncle? Because the uncle's just going to vouch for his brother. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But remember, that's what DCF does, and it's their regulations so that if there is a family um, initially and they're ready, willing, able, and they they qualify, then they do go with family. And it was. You know, again, nice at least initially because you have a very young child and then older children, and sometimes that's tough. They sometimes get separated mm -hmm. if they're um, placed with um, foster families. Lester. Yeah. You know, Professor, <coughs> you said the children recanted their prior and, state. Yes, yes. Now, this is what I'm trying to understand in, in looking at my notes. Are oh, they wait, stop. There's something else I forgot. So their attorney is also saying that they won't, because they can be called by DCF. Their attorney is saying that they will not testify at trial. So think about, I don't believe you, them. Uh, you know, what arguments would you be making as the attorney that um, they sh shouldn't be testifying? I didn't mean to cut you off, but well, I totally okay. forgot about that. That's fine. I, I was just trying to make sense of, did the children say they did not say Sometimes. what Ellen and Yes. Or, wait, or they, said they it was say misinterpreted. their father did not do this? They said their initial statements were misinterpreted. Um, that there was an incident, an inc at least an incident or incidents where um, they, they were asked to undress um, because it was a big deal. Alicia made some big deal about walking in on the shower. To Jason. Yeah, so we call that the shower incident. And that's what they said really happened and that the initial investigators misinterpreted their answers. So it's not that they are saying, the children are saying, we didn't say what they said we said, but they didn't understand what we said. Yeah, yeah. But then. Yeah. Which, which effectively was a re recantation of their initial statements, um, which is typical, and that's another statistic that some of you may be able to use, which is said is typical in uh, child sexual abuse cases. Well, especially when they realize that they're going to be separated from the father. Yeah, from the father, from each other. Um, another thing that's said, and again, you'll see it through your cases, that um, the um, child victim, they say, is sometimes almost more traumatized by the process than the initial abuse. I thought that um, came through clearly. Okay. Because yeah. now these kids were, um, again, uh, interviewed initially at the home, saying, tried to interview them. The um, doctor's expert also interviewed them. Then they were interviewed by state's experts. Um, yeah, again, kept coming to court, you know, court date after court date. Yeah. The reason why they were changing their story so much was in the beginning they were so open to give so much information yes. because they were under the impression 
that they would be reunited with their yes. father. Yes. Yes. But once they they realized, yes. okay, then yeah. they stopped. Yes. Do you think that, uh, because it was around the same time, the Fells Acre case yeah. had anything to do with how they handled this one? Yes. Because there was so much leading questions in yes. that one. Yes. Yeah. Was the Fells Acre yeah. the Emerald family? Yeah. 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 Fells mm -hmm. Lester doesn't know. Was it Molden or Medford? I think it was Medford. Oh, no. I think it was Malden. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Malden. And it was the same county, correct? Middlesex. The what? Same county, Middlesex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tricky Emerald. Did you get hardened to it after a while, listening to this? No. Paying attention to it? No, because each case is so individual and, and, and diff, you know, it's so different. Yeah, the, the law might be the same, yeah. but the facts are always so different and the personal, personalities are so different. And they're all human. You know, um, so what's presented now, again, you know, and the investigator recognized that there's still family dy dynamics here, that possibly this is a family that, that you know, can, with help, um, be able to, yeah, everybody's making faces. Hey, don't you just look at it from your perspective of like, if you were that kid's parents, would you want them with that? I mean, you just, I don't know, I pers personalize it in terms of those are my kids when I want them with that person. But I don't know if you could do that. I don't know if you have to it, distance well, in, yourself. To in, in many of the, you know, he happened to be a, a, a step parent, but in many of the cases, it's a bio parent, yeah. um, not just a step parent or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Yeah. I, I did some research on that mm -hmm. issue, and oh, I, good. Found, I found that. Um, Step parent mm -hmm. is considered the same degree of consanguinity as the biological parent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's why the investigator was looking, you know, for a way to keep this family together. Yeah. Especially where Lee was, um, you know, involved with the mother of the children for a very long time and, you know, brought the kids up. The kids didn't know didn't even know their bio father. I still found that surprising. Uh, they just wanted to cling on to something, you know. No, no, I meant I found it surprising that from a legal standpoint, from a legal standpoint, uh, yeah, a step yeah exactly. Yeah. It was considered yeah. the mm -hmm. same degree of consanguinity yeah, well, as Lee, the bio father. Again, Lee counsel, Lee is afforded yeah. counsel in the camp that, for that very same reason. He's afforded counsel in the care and protection case. His interests are the familial, uh, you know, rights that we've been talking about. Yeah, Jeff. I, I just thought it, it was interesting what he was talking about. In, in New, I work in New Hampshire, and in New Hampshire, it's a little different, and it's different in with regards to the step parent and, and the biological parent. In New Hampshire, you can use uh, physical discipline on your child, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. corporal punishment. Yes, yes. And obviously. That is only allowed between the biological, they call it parents with special responsibilities, is, is the second book. It's only allowed between the biological parent and the child. The step parent does not afford those same privileges, and we, we deal with that often. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. All right. So you have the background, and we'll get started on Tuesday. All right. Thank you.